halfway through the semester, because I think that we only had six quizzes during the semester, and that was the third out of six. So um, your next homework assignment is due on Sunday, and we're going to continue through the in-class exercise today uh, some of the things that are included on that assignment. Um, today I've created a spot on iLearn where you can upload your draft for part one of the paper. Uh, that's a safe assignment, and what it means is it's going to scan your paper for plagiarism. Um, and of course, on part one especially, you're supposed to be, as, as our librarian said, it's a kind of a summary. And so it's fine if you use quotes. You know, if you're taking information from other sources, that's fine, but you need to be sure and put quotation marks around it when you're copying something word for word. And uh, at the end of that information from another source, you cite, you cite it. Even if you rearrange the words slightly, it's still you need to put the citation if the main idea or if the statistics come from another source. Just changing some of the words around doesn't mean you no longer have to cite it. You still have to cite the, uh, the reference. Yeah? I'm really sorry. You know, I can either be the kind of professor who's organized or I can be the kind who's just giving you assignments willy-nilly, and no, no, absolutely not. Let, let's take a look at the whole semester. You know, this is something that needs to be addressed. You know, I don't decide the assignments just because I think it would be fun to have it on a certain day. I do it because there's a certain number of topics we have to cover, and it can only all fit if we approach it in an organized way. So let me try and pull up our course schedule and illustrate why I'm not able to accommodate that request. All right. All right, so the schedule I gave you at the beginning of the semester is under syllabus, schedule. All right, let me see if I can zoom in a bit. All right, you have a very busy semester, and this isn't the only class you're taking. I know that. Um, but at the same time, ABET requires we get through all of these topics. If we don't go over all of those topics, then we risk not being an accredited university. Part of the reason you're here is because AUS has a good reputation, has ABET accreditation, and the only way that we can give you that quality education is if we cover all of the topics. And so if I start delaying an assignment, then I have to shift everything down and some of the things at the end of the semester would fall off the list. And so, you know, I, I try and be very organized about it. As much as possible, I try and spread things out, but sometimes you're going to have assignments due when you've got assignments due in other classes as well. And there's just no avoiding that. It's going to continue to be the case um, when you graduate and you're working professionally. You'll probably have a huge project due at the office at the same time that maybe you have personal things going on at home as well. So, unfortunately, no, we, we can't shift the assignment. Yeah? Yeah. I'm going to have to make some adjustments because they've changed when the National Day holiday and Martyr's Day, right? So what they're going to do, see here it says Tuesday, December 1st. I think what they've decided is that we're going to have that class on Monday. So we'll have classes two days in a row. We'll have class on Sunday and Monday. So the only thing that you'll need to do is just change where it says Tuesday to Monday. And December 1st, I think it'll be the uh, 30th of November. All right. So back to the announcements. Uh, we will have that assignment due on the 1st. And um, it's not necessarily too detailed. You're going to see from today's in-class exercise that the calculations can be done very quickly. Before we get into the talk about biochemical oxygen demand, there's a, an idea that we didn't get a chance to talk about last time in class, and that's called biomagnification. And um, biomagnification depends on when you look at an ecosystem, what kind of animals eat other animals? And this is sometimes called the food chain or the food web, and it may be something you remember from your earlier classes. Um, but at the top of the food chain are predator species uh, that eat other animals. And so a porpoise or a, a dolphin or a whale, something at the top of the food chain is going to be eating fish, 
that themselves have eaten zooplankton, which zooplankton feed on phytoplankton. And so at the bottom of the food chain are plants that grow on sunlight. And biomagnification is the idea that some kind of a pollutant that's present in this phytoplankton is going to be magnified in the zooplankton because the animal that eats this keeps all of the pollution. And so even if there's only a little bit of pollution in the phytoplankton, over its lifespan, the zooplankton is eating a lot of it. And all of the pollution will stay in the body of the zooplankton. And then the same thing is true of the fish. The fish that is eating a lot of zooplankton or other fish, all of the constituents that are fat soluble will stay inside of the fish and over time magnify and accumulate. And so at the top of the food chain, animals like porpoises or you know, if, we, if we talk about land mammals, it could be uh, lions or humans are at the top of the food chain because we eat a lot of other animals. We experience biomagnification, which is the process of chemicals magnifying as you go each step through the food web. So this is an illustration that's just showing, in the case of DDT, which is a, a chemical that was added to uh, try and uh, stop mosquitoes, which uh, cause malaria. Um, but it, it happens to be very harmful to the eggs of birds. It makes the eggs of birds very thin and weak. And so even if there's a low concentration of DDT in water, that low concentration in the water may not be harmful, but then plankton are in the water, and so it magnifies. You can see the concentration is higher. And each successive step up the food chain, there's a concentration of DDT until it gets to the fish-eating duck that has a very high concentration of, e of DDT, and then that starts to affect, uh, affect the ability of the duck to reproduce. So this is a concept we need to be worried about. Um, because whatever's in the meat will stay in us. Yes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, DDT is what they use to try and, uh, and stop the mosquitoes. It was a very famous chemical. It was used a, lo a lot through the 1940s and 50s, and they finally stopped using it in the 1960s. There are some countries, I think, where it still gets used, but um, in most of the... Uh, most of the world, it, it hasn't been used for a while because of the harmful effects it has on the environment. It was kind of a famous thing. The, the chemical company that, uh, when this whole controversy came out, when they started to realize that DDD, DDT caused problems in, uh, in the environment, the president of the company took a spoonful of DDT and ate it, just ate the chemical straight, just to emphasize that it's not harmful to humans. But that's because humans don't lay eggs. You know, it, it was. Uh, the environmental you know, like species, fish and birds do lay eggs, and so that's sort of what the issue was with that. All right, so that's a completely separate idea from the rest of what we're talking about today. Uh, what we're talking about today is something that's known as biochemical oxygen demand. And uh, biochemical oxygen demand can best be explained by using an illustration of sugar cubes. So. Let's step through some questions. Is sugar toxic? It's not toxic. You know, too much sugar is bad for you. We all know that. But sugar itself is not uh, poison, and it doesn't damage us, and it doesn't directly damage the environment. But indirectly, sugar can be considered a pollutant, and that's because of the effect that it has when we add it to water. So if you were to pour some sugar into a stream, like a small stream and you had a big bag of sugar, what would happen if you pour that sack of sugar into the stream, then the bacteria that naturally live in the water would start to use the sugar. They, can, they consider it as food. Now bacteria in water don't get their oxygen from the air like you and I do. Bacteria that live in water are getting their oxygen from the water itself. There's a little bit of dissolved oxygen in the water, and so fish get their oxygen by breathing the air that's dissolved in water, and bacteria are the same way. So if you add sugar to the water, you're stimulating the bacteria, and so they grow, and there's more and more bacteria, and that huge population of bacteria means that they're consuming more dissolved oxygen, and they can consume a lot of disoxygen. In fact, they're going to reproduce, the bacteria will divide, and then the new cells will divide, and the population will grow and grow. 
until there could be a very huge demand for oxygen in the stream because all the bacteria see an unlimited food supply. And so if you think about in the environment, when there's an unlimited food supply, there can be a really high growth in the organisms that use that. So BOD, biochemical oxygen demand, is just the idea that uh, you can measure a pollutant by the effect it has. You can measure how much pollution there is by the demand for oxygen to break it down. Not all pollution requires oxygen to be broken down, and not all pollution can be consumed by microorganisms. But we're going to begin talking about wastewater in a couple of weeks, and wastewater has a lot of leftover energy in it that the bacteria will consume. And so as the bacteria break down the organic material in wastewater, they also use oxygen. So let's, let's draw an analogy. Which of those foods has a higher water demand? If you're going to eat a carrot and eat an equivalent mass of potato chips, which one has a higher water demand? Think about how thirsty you'd be if you eat salty chips. I should mention that these are very salty chips. Very, very salty. So if you eat the chips, you're going to demand water. And it's, it's not that the, the chips themselves are asking for water. We don't have to pour water on the chips, but it, it's the effect. It's the, the, the side effect of the salty chips. Yeah, that's true. So when I'm talking about water demand, I'm thinking in terms of uh, the person who's eating it. How much will they drink to be satisfied? But you've got a good point that uh, maybe carrots require a lot of irrigation. And so the water demand I'm speaking about is just like in your mouth. How thirsty do you get after you eat it? So another way to think about it, which activity has a higher oxygen demand? Playing soccer, football, playing football, or doing football on a video game? Okay? Think about uh, if you're actually running and doing the sport, you're going to have a high oxygen demand because your metabolism is elevated. But then if you're playing the game, maybe your metabolism will be elevated a little bit because it's exciting. But it's, it's not exercise, right? You eat the chips, and that's exercise, maybe, if you eat enough of them. All right? So these are both just analogies, just to get you back to the idea of what is biochemical oxygen demand. It is the effect of adding some sort of uh, food source to water. Because if you add food, the bacteria are also going to want oxygen. Here's the effect. Let me dim the light so you can see this better. If we have a pipe and we're discharging wastewater to a river, this wastewater has a food source for the microorganisms. Bacteria don't eat the same thing that you and I eat. You know, we eat shawarma, falafels. Bacteria, they like sugar. They like uh, carbohydrates. It doesn't matter what form it's in. They'll eat uh, sucrose and they'll eat really complex carbohydrates more slowly. But um, what this graph is showing, the dashed line is showing the concentration of food. And so as soon as the pipe discharges the wastewater, the concentration of food is very high. The solid line is showing the concentration of dissolved oxygen. So what do you notice as we go downstream? The water is flowing from the left to the right. What do you notice about the trend of those two lines? Yeah, they seem to be going in opposite directions, right? So let's, let's think about why. There's a lot of food, and suddenly the oxygen starts going down when we introduce the food. Why is the oxygen going down when the food is introduced? because the bacteria are starting to consume it. Right. And so the reason why the oxygen was high at the beginning was there was nothing for the bacteria to eat. There was no food source, and so they didn't require oxygen, or at least not very much. Suddenly, we're giving them a lot of food, and why is the food concentration going down? Because there's consumption, right? And then it goes back to normal concentration of whatever that food source was. Oxygen is going down, and it reaches a minimum point. Why is it going back up again? Okay, so there's no more food source. 
But why is the oxygen going back up after it's been consumed by the bacteria? All right, there's no food to attract more bacteria. The fish eat the bacteria. There are things that do eat the bacteria. There's more oxygen coming in from the air. And so there's recharge of the oxygen. You know, the water is flowing, it's mixing, and so it's very slow, but gradually, over time, oxygen comes from the air and it seeps back into the water. It transfers. Okay, we're going to talk a lot of detail about this, uh, they call it a SAG model. We're going to do this uh, next week. But for today, it's important for us just to learn more about what is this oxygen demand. So we've talked about BOD. The B stands for biochemical. There's also THOD. THOD is what if you did a chemical reaction? Instead of using bacteria to break down the food source, what if you just broke it down using uh, a chemical reaction? If you broke it down to its simplest components, if you, if you broke it down all the way to carbon dioxide and H2O, it would be a different amount. And the reason why is that sometimes the bacteria can't break down all of the carbohydrate. There are some carbs that are too complex for a simple organism like a, a bacteria to be able to metabolize. Bacteria prefer sugar. I guess sort of like us. We prefer sugar too, right? Co uh, simple carbs are tasty. Complex carbs like oatmeal, uh, you know, they'll fuel us, but somehow they don't taste as delicious. Okay, so theoretical oxygen demand is going to be larger than biochemical oxygen de demand because it may include things that the bacteria can't break down. Um, COD is how much we would actually measure in the lab if we did the chemical reaction breaking it down. And so there are some carbohydrates that even wouldn't be oxidized by a strong, uh, a strong acid. So theoretical is just sort of if you look at the mass of what's there, Chemical is if you observe it with the reaction, and then biochemical is if it's the breaking down from the bacteria. Um, ultimate oxygen demand is if you look at how much oxygen they're going to require to break down all of the food that's available in the end, because it takes them a while to do it. When you first supply the food, which is sugar or some kind of other carbohydrate, when you first supply the food, there may not be very many bacteria. And so it takes them a while to get going. They have to divide and establish a big population. And so over time, the speed at which they're breaking down the food is going to increase. But if we think about uh, how much food is there to begin with, we label that L0. Um, because we remember are measuring how much food there is by the demand for oxygen. And so what this is showing is that at the beginning, at time zero, this first curve that I'm pointing at is how much BOD they've used so far. You know, how much oxygen has there been? So at time zero, there isn't any oxygen demand yet. But over time, they're requiring more and more oxygen. And now the curve is starting to taper off. It's starting to get flat. Why do you suppose this curve is starting to flatten out in terms of the, the, amount, the cumulative amount of oxygen that's been required? Why is it getting flatter? OK. Yeah, exactly. They're running out of food. And so microorganisms are kind of like first order reactions. When there's less food, the rate of the reaction decreases. And so at this point, you can see this curve is getting very low. We can think about how much food is remaining. When there's very little food remaining, you eat it more slowly. Think about if you were in a lifeboat out in the middle of the ocean. When you're down to your last can of sardines, you're going to make every one count. You're going to really savor it. It's totally different than how quickly you'd maybe eat at a, a, a large buffet. And so that's an example, of just a, an analogy of first order kinetics. So here, the two things that we're seeing, L stands for the amount of oxygen demand that there's going to be ultimately. L naught is in the end when it's used up all of the oxygen demand it's going to need, how much was that? And BOD with a subscript of T 
That means how much oxygen has there been up until a certain time? T. Here are the formulas, and we can either express it in uh, base E terms or base 10. And so base E is what's associated with logarithm, natural log, and base 10 is associated with LOG instead of LN. And what you'll notice is that uh, there are two different Ks. There's a lowercase k that we associate with base E units and a capital K that's associated with base 10. And uh, some references will give K values in base 10 units and some will give it in base E units. And so you have to be able to convert between the two. They differ by a factor of 2.303. Let's take a look at this uh, in-class exercise. Um, we have a BOD at the end of eight days is 180.9. And so that is BOD sub T, 180.9. We know that the ultimate BOD is 212. So if you give the bacteria an unlimited amount of time to break down this food source, how much oxygen they're going to need is 212 milligrams per liter of oxygen. So that is L naught. With this, we want to uh, calculate the rate constant in terms of base E and base 10. Yes? That's right. And so he, he was just clarifying, BOD sub T, that means the total amount of oxygen that has been used so far up until time T. And so it uh, looks like after four days in this figure, after four days they have used maybe 125 milligrams per liter of oxygen. After six days they've required 160 milligrams per liter of oxygen and so on. Um, all right, you know since we are low on time today what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring up the calculations and let you take a look at those. I'm not going to collect today's in-class exercise. I'm going to have you hold on to that, and I'll just use the quiz for attendance purposes. Um, and so you can copy the solution down onto the in-class exercise. And the main reason I want you to keep it is because of the second, um, the second part of today's in-class exercise. And so let me pull up this, and we'll just take a look at it. OK, that's nice. Rotate view. All right, that's better. Okay, so we have given the amount of oxygen that's demanded after eight days and the amount that's demanded if you give them an unlimited amount of time. They need 212. We're trying to find lowercase k, which is uh, base E units, and capital K. And so the way that we do it is rearrange the equation that's provided to try and isolate K. And so what we're going to do is uh, rearrange it by moving the ultimate BOD over to the left side and use the natural log to get the, uh, the E function canceled out so that we can solve for K. So when we substitute in the numbers, for the lowercase K, it's going to be 0.24 days to the minus 1. The units are inverse days. And then you can calculate it, the uppercase K just by using the 2.303 factor. Or this is just showing if I rearranged to try and solve for the uppercase K in the same way that we did with natural log, just substitute in LOG instead of LN. And it's 0 0.104 inverse days. All right. I'm sorry that we don't have uh, time for you to go through those calculations yourself. I think that's probably more valuable, but um, you know, the idea is out there, and you can come back to the video if you'd like to take a second look at that after class. Okay, let's move on to talking more about how BOD is actually measured. The way that you do it is you take a sample of water, and you find out how much oxygen is in the water before you do the test, and then you measure 
the concentration of dissolved oxygen after the test. During the test, the water has to be in an airtight container. And the reason for that is that you don't want oxygen going into the water while you're doing a test because that would sort of throw off the results of your test. If you're trying to find out how much oxygen the bacteria use to break down the food, you're going to just have to see the before minus the after. Um, it's incubated at a constant temperature in the dark so that there isn't any growth of algae. And then you measure the final concentration of dissolved oxygen. So here is the amount of BOD. It's just the initial concentration of oxygen minus the final amount of concentration of oxygen. Sometimes there's so much BOD in water that you actually have to dilute it in order to do the test because water only holds at the most about 16 milligrams per liter of oxygen. That's the highest concentration at the best solubility, about 16 milligrams per liter of oxygen. And so if you know that a waste has a concentration of BOD higher than that, then you would do a dilution. And this formula is showing that uh, you would take a small sample of water, maybe, these bottles are usually 300 milliliters. You could take a 30 milliliter sample, add it to the water, and then pour in pure water that doesn't have any BOD, and then it would be, looted, it would be diluted by a factor of 10 to 1. And so I think that this uh, sort of thing you'll probably get to in the lab for the environmental, and you'll see how a bottle test actually proceeds. Yes, dissolved oxygen means, <laughs> DO is dissolved oxygen. Yeah, the concentration of dissolved oxygen. Here's a figure that shows the concentration of dissolved oxygen as a function of temperature. What you can see is that warm water can't have as much dissolved oxygen as cold water. We talked about that last time. We talked about how salmon and trout require cold water. And the reason why is they use a lot of dissolved oxygen. And so some fish can live in warm water because they don't use as much dissolved oxygen as some of the others. All right. This is the last thing that I wanted to show you today because this is on your homework. It's a very simple, a very simple graphical procedure. On the in-class exercise, you'll see that there's a data set. And the data is uh, time versus the concentration of BOD. In the Thomas graphical method, what you're trying to do is find out what is the ultimate BOD concentration and then also what is the K value. Uh, this is a way of, once you have the lab data, using it to find the ultimate demand. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Oh, yes, this is the small k. Right. Um, so in this method, what you do is you start off by having the time divided by the BOD to the one-third power. And you've got some data that's shown there. And then on the back, if you'll turn over your page, you'll notice that we have a graph that has time on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis is T divided BOD to the one-third power. So what you do is you follow these steps here. First, you calculate T divided by BOD to the one-third power, and then you plot that versus time. And so you'd have, you know, on the case here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. You plot your six data points, draw a line through them, as it says in step two, and then you look at the slope and intercept of the line. And the slope is given the uh, variable B, and the intercept is given the variable A. Let me show you a uh, look at how that works out. All right, so this is for the example that's on, uh, on today's in-class exercise. I took the data and I calculated in this step, this is the value of T divided by BOD to the one-third power. And then I plotted those points on the figure and I drew a line trying to find, you know, what's the best line that goes through those data points. 
and then the slope of the line is going to be the rise divided by the run. And so what I did is I said, in five days, how much does this line go up? And it was 0 0.07 units. And so over here in the calculations, the, uh, the slope of the line is B, and so that's 0 0.014, because I have this delta Y divided by delta X. So that's where the B comes from. A is the intercept, so you look at where does this curve intercept the uh, vertical axis, and I estimated that to be 0 0.301. And so then the K value is simply 6 times B divided by A, and so from that you can estimate a K value for this particular waste. How quickly are the bacteria breaking down the waste is what K tells you. And then L0 is if you let it keep going for a very long time, how much oxygen will they need? And so if we look at this data, we only know how much oxygen they need after eight days. But maybe that's as long as we have to test it. We can't keep testing forever. This process allows you to estimate at the very end when they've used up all of the waste, how much oxygen they, are they going to need. And that's what this L0 refers to. They're, in the very end, going to need 131 milligrams of oxygen for every liter of water that we're trying to treat. All right. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Um, take a look at this and try and uh, you know, get an early start on the homework because the homework, uh, it's not due until, what did we say, Monday? Oh, Sunday. All right. <laughs> I'll be checking my email over the weekend. So if you've got questions, send me a message and I will respond.